All right, good morning. Uh, my name is Laura. I'm going to be the one trying to remember to stay in front of that camera and hopefully talking to you for a bit. Um, seven track conference is really hard. You end up having to make some really awful choices. So as much as I appreciate you all being in the room, that's pretty awesome. Um, I understand that people are in other exciting things too and that people are going to catch up on the video, so that's fine. Um, I run a security company in New Zealand and I am the security equivalent of a cat herder. I bring security into places where security does not dare to tread. Uh, I work with companies in six countries, spanning from teensy tiny little startups through to giant enterprises who are on the brink of extinction because the internet happened. Um, so, before we get into the meeting, while well, these lovely gentlemen come and make their way slowly in, it's okay, I don't blame you. Um, and we're only going to stare a little bit. The world is a terrible place. So, it's traditional for a security person to tell you this. You're pretty much screwed. The internet is a festering, toxic wasteland. We know this. Uh, how many of you write code? Good. I didn't end up at the wrong conference. That's always awkward. <laughs> how many of you have code on the internet you wish had died in a fire? Mm -hmm. How many of you supervise interns or graduates? Yep. So you're propagating the problem. So yay. <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to the future. Hello, gentlemen. Please do take a seat. Uh, you can sit on that side, but we'll probably stare a bit. OK, so the internet is a bad place. The cats on it are sad, blah, 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 blah. We know that somebody probably wants to do bad things to your computer. Um, depending on where you work, you're worried from everything that you know, China's coming. They're not, by the way, for most of you. Uh, or Russia, if you read anything from the, the Democratic Party in the US at the moment. Russia definitely care. Um, or just some local teenager sat in a basement who's wearing a hoodie and gloves. Um, I forgot my hacker uniform today, you'll have to forgive me. And of course the internet now looks like this. Um, you know, it's a horrible, festering, quite adversarial space where JavaScript is generating really scary visualizations that are selling a lot of product. Um, if you want to contribute to the mess that is security vendor space, I suggest starting with writing JavaScript threat visualizations. Uh, because that's all this is. Uh, pew pew, if you go onto GitHub, look for pew pew. So it's beyond hope. You're screwed. We're screwed. We're all in this together. Great, fantastic. I don't think it's like that. I, I sat in Scott's talk this morning looking at what JavaScript is becoming. It's torn directly down the middle in two. Part of me is an engineer and loves building things. I've been lucky enough to write code for CERN that looks after radiation monitoring on the LHC. That's pretty amazing. I'm kind of proud of that. But at the same time, I've been lying, cheating, and stealing from computer systems for about a decade. And I know how badly wrong it tends to go when JavaScript gets in the mix. So we're on the cusp of beautiful, amazing things. How many of you can see a technical product in the world that you think is like sci-fi awesome from when you were a kid? So self-driving cars, we've got robots and computer systems that are diagnosing health conditions better than our practitioners are. We are teaching our kids in virtual worlds rather than physical ones. This is kind of sci-fi awesome. How many of you want to be the developer on a Tesla? Come on, this is future te tech. Want to send something into space? That's a genuine job now. It used to be like super niche, but now, no, no, you just have to work in the right part of the world. Sadly, doing this securely is really, really hard. Now, most people see me, and they think they're going to get the warm, huggy, fluffy version of security. And we're going to go, it's OK, we're in this together. Um, yeah, kind of, we are. But I'm actually more like GLaDOS than I am anything else. My job here today is to say, harden up. And to say that there is going to be no Batman. There is no swooping in the night team that is going to come and solve all of your security problems and protect your systems. It's not going to happen. You, engineers, us as a community, are going to be the ones that fix it. And hopefully, today, I'm going to give you a few things you can go away and get started all on your own. Let's not wait for somebody to miraculously give you budget or give a damn. Let's just get on with it. Because, well, we created the problems. I'm pretty sure we're the ones to fix them, too. 
So it's all, all going to be up to us. Um, security isn't just a magic show. I'm not here to show you that I can make JavaScript do a pop-up box and go, ta-da. Um, you could go Google that or write some JavaScript. I want to teach you about your role in prevention, detection, and response, because security is all of these things. It's not about getting a pen test once a year. And it's not about having the right vendor on tap. So what are we going to do today? Well, I'm going to turn you into superheroes, not the type of capes. I've been told this is dangerous and health and safety is important. But the type where I could come see you in 12 months' time and things have changed. The way you are developing software has changed. But you're still building awesome things. We're going to look at accepting some truths. We're going to look at protecting what we have, watching it, responding to problems, and learning from it. A lot of what I share today comes from bitter experience. Uh, my small company, we are five people. We are based in New Zealand. Uh, for anyone who's from out of town, that's hobbits, not kangaroos. Um, we build code. 50% of our time is building product. 50% is advisory and training. So there is nothing in this talk that I have not tried and failed at multiple times in the making of it. Um, there are lots of lessons here. There's lots of things I can share with you and go, I screwed up. And you should probably not do that next time. So let's get on with it. Let's, let's learn to accept. This is the, the closest to touchy-feely I do. We like writing code. We like building things. How many of you really enjoy planning meetings and doing Visio? There's always one. It's OK if that's you. Oh, it's OK. We can have hugs afterwards and, and cupcakes, maybe. I don't know. But most of the time, we're in a bit of a hurry to just get on and build something, right? We are given a scope or a spec, or just we have an idea, and we go and we build, and that's a beautiful thing. I write really terrible Python. I'm not even a .NET developer, but don't judge me. It's OK. Some of us, you know, we come from foreign places. I actually started out on COBOL, uh, because for some reason, my employer decided teaching a 16-year-old COBOL was the fun, future-proof way to uh, do things. I know what this feeling is like. But it means that we are a massive part of all of this. We are actually part of the problem. You are part of the problem. And I love you all dearly. I love engineering. I love, it. I love the concept that we can build amazing things. But we're dumb, and we're lazy. And we've spent most of our careers being told we're quite bright and that we're, we've done awesome things. And we, how many of you have had a, a performance review where you were above expectations, or you got a bonus at the end of it because you did a good job? Yeah? Awesome. The gold stars don't count for much. You, in this room, are more of a threat to your organization, your applications, than anyone sat a 1,000 miles away in a different country. Um, it's, it's not personal. It's me as well. Um, we'll talk about some of this, why this is a problem. The first bit stems from this graph here. Obviously, numbers don't exist in this world. It's a theory graph. We get an idea. We start building things. And given the types of people we are, we probably build things for fun, too, because switching off and having other hobbies sounds like a lot more work than we're used to. Um, we have an idea, and we start coding. And if we're really lucky, we only have to throw away two prototypes before we get something that doesn't look like somebody just spat code all over an editor. Eventually, maybe somebody uses it, or they buy it. Um, I'm hoping you are gainfully employed, um, and somebody pays you for your time. And so they might be buying your application at some point, using it. Is there anyone here who's looking for a job? OK, well, you should probably raise your hand if anyone asks at this kind of conference, because there's almost someone sat around you that's hiring. Because this skill set is really valuable. And then eventually, when we've like conquered the demographic we were looking for, and we've got MVP, and we've got the quarterly return and the whatever churn rate we want, or when our organization realizes that they're going to get in real legal trouble if they don't, we start doing security. And they start calling people like me in. Or even worse, people with clipboards and auditor hats. And we start looking at your world and going, what the hell just happened here? It's terrifying. How many of you know of a piece of code you have written or touched that really, really is a problem that should probably be wiped from the planet? Yeah? I know those bits of code. I call them my technical debt, which is a polite way of saying, oh my god, don't make me go back there. And of course, for every one of you who's building great things and then eventually trying to defend it, 
there are dozens of people who live in this beautiful attack space. The offensive world is lovely. If you ever wonder why most security people are penetration testers, it's because it's easy. I walk into a room, I take your beloved creation, I smash it with a hammer for two weeks, I tell you your baby is broken and ugly and I give it back and I walk away. It, that's a joyous experience for the first 15, 20 times. I never have to deal with the consequences of anything in the world. I just give you a broken thing and say, ha ha, sucks to be you. And there are dozens, hundreds, thousands of people in the attack space from vulnerability researchers, uh, who we're gonna cover a bit about how they think today, through to penetration testers, through to people who, the tech is actually only a distraction. It doesn't really matter how they get in, they just want whatever is on your servers. Um, think more organized crime, gun for hire, smash your window with a brick, rather than sophisticated Ocean's Eleven heist. So what did, what's the net effect of this? Why am I even giving this talk? Well, because as a result of this, my industry got rich, really, really rich. Um, we're worth $79 billion a year. That's a lot of money. How many of you are working in a team and you've got more budget than you can spend? Aha, uh -huh. this guy's hiring. <laughs> yeah, we, most of us are in a constrained position. There is more to achieve than we have the resources to do. But security's taken a massive chunk of budget. Now what I wanna do today is not about hating on vendors, I am a vendor of sorts. But what I want you to do is actually engage that engineering brain first and see what some of these things you can do yourself. I wanna actually kinda of lift a bit of the curtain on some of the magic that is security. It's not magic at all. You see, when you're busy throwing oodles and oodles and oodles of cash at fancy border devices or security equipment, what most people are actually buying is a really expensive Cat5 cable. We leave them in our server racks, we leave them in training or monitoring or reporting mode, and we feel really good because we ticked that security box, we did a thing. Um, if, as a developer, security isn't something you're doing every day, just in teeny tiny ways, you failed. It doesn't matter how many fancy Cat5 cables are in your rack. How many of you have ever had the misfortune of having to tune one of these web application firewalls or, or something that's actually protecting your code? One of you. Does that not scare anyone? We've got devices that are supposed to intelligently know our attack surface and our applications and what they're doing under the hood, and the people who build them, you lot, have never touched those devices. The last one I went to look at, it was almost, it looked like it come from a museum. It had been sat there for a year, two years, and it was spewing out 67,000 reports a day that were filing into DevNull. 67,000. Yeah. Do you know what? We could have probably solved that by having somebody who actually understood code look at it, right? So, before I regurgitate something that's going to be covered elsewhere, you are lucky this week. We have people like Troy Hunt here in the conference, doing conference things and talking to you. Some of you will have been to his workshop this week. Please listen to him. Go and find OWASP. I'm not here to tell you about the OWASP Top 10. If that's new to you, other people are going to cover that this week, I promise you. I am what they call an ops coder, an ops security person. My job is not to help you build a cathedral. Mine is to keep it standing long enough for somebody to come through the door. Uh, I'm a survivalist, if you will, a prepper. So first things first, I'm going to ask you very, very lightly, for now until the rest of forever, we're gonna start admitting our mistakes. This week I posted, I tweeted a picture of an actual board that is in my office. It says, number of days since our last fuck up. Um, it has two numbers. Um, I've been ridiculed publicly now for us actually thinking we could get to 10 days without a fuck up. Um, you can't. How many of you have failed in the last week at something? How many of you publicly own that? and went, yeah, God, that was silly. In our Slack channels in our company, we, we do security all the time, we live and breathe it. We have a Today I Learnt channel and that is the museum of fuck -uppery. excuse the language. This is all of the places we have gotten it wrong, the vulnerabilities we have introduced, the problems with servers and misconfigurations, the oopsies we've had with AWS keys that went a little bit more public than they should have. Admitting mistakes in security is rare. Nobody stands on stage and says, we're bad at this. I'm not bad at it, I've been doing it a long time, but I'm human, you're human. We're also all professionally making it up. How many of you have ever come into a job and they've gone, oh yeah, so um, how well do you know X framework? And you've gone, yeah, I totally know that. 
yeah, absolutely. Um, that guy wrote a blog post about it, and I've, yeah, don't, mm, I know that. That's, that's been me on more than one occasion. I have to switch between probably 12 languages in my average month. Um, for any of you who write Node, I hate you every single moment that you are alive. Just, but anyway, that's my problem, not yours. It's okay to realize that we're making up security. There's no Bible for this. There is no book. There are many books. They will take your money gladly, and they will have pretty pictures. There's no book for this. You know your environment. You make up the solutions. I'm going to show you some of the things you can make up, and it can be kind of fun. Um, I, security people have a strange definition of fun. So. And finally, before I get into the guts of some of the things we can do to protect, I'm going to say controversially, please, for the love of God, will you start using a password manager? <sighs> OK. Right. Please raise your hand if you have a password in your life that is older than five years. Raise your hand if you use a password for more than one system. Raise your hand if you know a password for a system you're not supposed to know the password to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're building the systems, and we expect our users to be better than us. So I'm not going to delve into the, the ABCs of choosing good passwords. You know this. And if you've been following the internet, you know password managers are having a bit of a bad week. Uh, Tavis got bored. Tavis does that. He decides to pick a software type. This week it's password managers. And shells rain from the sky. Doesn't mean you should stop using them, because I'm going to tell you their buggy software is more secure than what you're doing all by yourself. You can buy legitimate $4 uh, US, a password book that is more secure than what you're doing now, that you write in with a pen. Fantastic. Right, that's me ranting. Ah, OK, so the whole world's going to be built in JavaScript. You lot are going to be the architects of our disasters. And we're going to have to protect it. Now, what I really liked about Scott's talk is he used the puppy analogy, which is beautiful because I don't have to start at the same point. But it's the same deal, right? He danced and very gently put around this. He described your software as you know, having to be fed and watered and, and patched. I'm going to take it further. Your software is a puppy or a baby, and it's beautiful, and it'll be novel for about three weeks. And then it's going to start pooping on your carpet. It's really, really going to poop all over your carpet. Now, by that I mean it's not going to perform like you thought it was going to. It's not going to scale as well. That feature you thought was definitely you know, going to be the differentiator, the, the killer feature, is actually going to sink quicker than you know what to do with it. And then we're going to add security on top of that, because Maybe you sold some stuff, and people started realizing who you were. And they're going to stop prodding it in ways you weren't expecting. Now, we have to admit that every, every piece of software has security flaws. The only mathematical way to prove the lack of security flaws takes us far, far past functional programming into like uber geek land. If any of you sat through lessons in Z and things when you were younger and, and less likely to walk out of a lecture, it's painful to mathematically prove that software is safe or secure. We can't do that. So first thing, your software has bugs. You wrote many of them. You inherited some of them. Some of them didn't exist when you first wrote the code. The framework has changed around you and changed the way your code is behaving now. So we have to admit that. Well, that's great if you've just got one <coughs> lovable puppy piece of software and you get to feed and water it and look after it. How many of you are on multiple projects in your life? How many of you have caught microservices? Yeah. Uh, I'm coming back on Friday. You can come and talk with me about architecture and security in microservices. Um, we're going from having one application to API-driven things where you might have 300. And now, if you think it's painful to shovel poop for one puppy, you wait till you've got 300. This is not fun. And of course, there's something more than that. How many of you write all of your code yourself? No, nobody. Oh, OK. Again, with the interventions, please don't. There's no need. We've moved past it, unless you're an embedded Linux developer, in which case I don't know why you're here. But we love you. The software we're building our software with also has flaws. Now, I do, I, I rag on Node a little bit. I give them a hard time. But that's because I've seen what happens when you compile JavaScript applications compared to a .NET. So .NET, you might write a hello world, and it comes out. Once it's compiled, uh, you know, a little bit bigger than what you put in. It's pulled in a few libraries and frameworks, and job done. With JavaScript, you go from having six lines of JavaScript to 14,000 lines of JavaScript, and your dependency tree starts to look like some really fragmented graph of the world. 
that's complex. How many of you know how many technologies you're using in your stack? First step of security is know it, even if you don't like the answer. Um, because we get a bit crazy with this, right? It's really fun to bring in new libraries and frameworks. We'd be really sad if we were all stuck on old versions of .NET and had to code everything by hand. We wouldn't get much done at all. So part of protecting is understanding what you're protecting, because you don't just protect your code. You protect, you take on the responsibility for every module and framework you bring in with you. And not all of them are as mature as others. Now, the left pad incident of the node world was a really interesting example of this. Six lines. The average length of a dependency in the node land is six lines of code. And yet, we took away one dependency and the world collapsed. Now, I think it's interesting that left pad caused everything to collapse in a big heap because we lost one dependency, but I find it even more interesting to think what I could do with that. Now, if I only have to write six node lines to get into NPM, then even I could do that, and I absolutely detest node. So, what am I going to do with my six lines of code? Am I going to do something useful or not? Because I'm sure as hell node is looking through every line of every dependency in NPM or in Maven or in any other repository. So if I know my six lines suddenly gets into a million projects because dependencies are dependent on dependencies are dependent on dependencies, do you know what we just built? We just built a worm. Now, how many uh, worms are a bit before some of yours time? Some of you look like actually new and young and enthusiastic. Go read about them. They were fun um, when MySpace was still a thing. Uh, this is the joyous thing. We have worms now that infect petrol stations. There are chains of petrol stations in Europe where they've had to physically firewall off the pay at the pump devices. They are on completely isolated, segregated networks. And that's because their dependency chain is so complex, they can't update them. And so one of them got configure, and then all of them got configure. And then they patched one, and it was self-replicating. And basically, so pay at the pump devices, that kind of space, it's actually, once you get it out there, really hard to protect. You end up doing silly things like creating little islands of petrol stations that are quite literally toxic. So, <laughs> funny story. How many of you are having fun with the hotel Wi-Fi? <laughs> yeah. Um, so my VM decided it was going to poop itself a little bit. Um, so we're going to do this the old school way, and you're going to have a bit of homework to go and look at it. But I'm going to show you a couple of things that are going to help you get into your code base and actually start looking at what the risk is for you from dependencies. Some of these you will have seen before. If you run open source projects, everything I'm mentioning here is free. If you run closed source, you may have to pay small amounts of money, but I'm talking like $20, not $3 million. So, you know, if I do mention a product, hey, I'm not affiliated with it, I get no money, I just use it day to day. I can tell you the warts and the joys of using it. Um, but even somebody with a small spend credit card can get this stuff done. So let's have a go at this. This is going to fail horribly. All right. Oop -a -doop -a -doo. Okay, first things first, we're going to have a talk about the free option. Let's do the free option. Right. Oh, come on. Doop -a -doop, we can do it. Doop -a -doop, mirror. Hooray! Oh, you do deep, deep tech every day, and changing the display settings on a Mac is a victory. Wonderful. OK, so let's talk about OWASP Dependency Checker. Uh, OWASP, big organization. If you've not heard of it yet, you've got homework to do. But they have many, many projects other than the OWASP Top 10, which is one you will have all been told about. And one of them is this. It's the OWASP Dependency Checker. It has plugins for, you will see them linked, Maven, Jenkins, there's a Mac Homebrew. You can go and use this today. And it's really easy to set up. It's an old project. It's been around a very long time. And it's what they call flagship or mature, which means it's not going anywhere either. It's run by volunteers from the community. And some very, very bright people are contributing to this. You can go and see the source code. It's that kind of deal. Now, OWASP Dependency Checker does one job, and it does it very well. It looks at your dependencies in your Maven build or in Ant or whatever it's plugged into, and it looks at the versions you're using, and it goes, there's a vulnerability in that, a security vulnerability. You should probably do something about it. And it has the power to stop your build. Now, I know some of you haven't reached continuous integration and continuous deployment yet. We all seem to believe we've all got to this utopia. We don't. Less than 10% of my customers have actually reached that. But whether you're doing that or not, you can trigger this manually. 
you can go right now for this point in time, am I vulnerable? Now, your decision might be to go, well, yeah, I am, but I kind of don't care. That's OK, because you've changed your security risk from being yellow to I've made a dumb decision and I've got it written down somewhere, which actually it's much better to do that than it is to just go, it's fine. It's fine. I've never been hacked before. So that's OWASP dependency check. Now, if anyone wants to come and find me afterwards, I'm happy to do demos of it. But you don't need it. You're engineers. Uh, this is not a magic show. Now, if you're a little bit more GitHub-y, um, then libraries.io is an awesome alternative. So uh, we run open source projects, and we run closed source. Um, I'm showing you our open source stuff here, um, something called Ava. You don't need to worry about what that is. But it's written in Django, so Python framework. And trust me, Django is as messy with dependencies as .NET and as anything else. So you know we have as much to uh, gain from using this as you do. It's written by a gentleman in the UK um, called Andrew. Um, I can name their entire development team. That tells you the size of this project. Never see a glossy web page and assume that it's a big company. They probably want your help and probably your funding if you work for a big organization. But he gives this away for free to open source and for a very, very small fee for closed. And what happens is you, you sign up with your repository, so you can see my organizations here. You tick a box, you hit a button. This is not technical. I'm hoping we're all seeing this is quite easy to sign up for. Um, and you can get subscriptions. It will email you, it will message you, and it will tell you when a new version of your software is available. Really simple, right? But what we've done is we've taken a chaotic mess of dependencies we weren't really paying attention to. How many of you will honestly, hand on heart, say that you've been monitoring the news and know when all of your dependencies need updating? Yeah, nobody does this. Everyone's supposed to, nobody does. I know people who are using scarily old versions of libraries because, well, you know, it still works. It's fine. I'll update when I need the new features. This is going to do it for you. They also have dependency CI, which is, um, fits into your continuous integration pipeline. Now, these aren't the only tools that do this. There are glorious $50,000 a year subscription-based vendor products that will also do this. So, you know, go nuts if you've got budget. Gentlemen here, go wild. Vendor Hall is waiting just for you. Um, but if you're not, if you run an open source project or if you're running a bit of the world that doesn't have this kind of luxury or need to prove value to your bosses before you spend a bit of money, this can be a really good thing to do. I'd rather know that I'm screwed than have a blissful existence and find it kind of surprising and scary later. Come on, you can do it. Right, I will be sharing these slides afterwards. All of the links to everything I show you are on the slides. So please check out my Twitters. It's lady underscore nerd, and you will find them. Please do not tweet the other lady nerd without the underscore. She gets upset, and she doesn't give a damn about engineering or computers. So we started to protect. We started looking at what we're building. We've accepted we have flaws. You're going to go to Troy Hunt's talk and the others this week and get lots of skills for that protect section. Now we need to figure out what the hell is going on and protect ourselves, right? Because, well, we're going to get attacked. That's a statistical likelihood. Most of us, in reality, are ill-prepared for this. Um, it's all very well to say, yeah, well, you know, the security team are monitoring us in a 24 by 7 support arrangement. I'm sure many of you have marketing websites that say that's what's going on. Or you've bought products from vendors who say that's what's going on. So AWS do have a lovely monitoring team, but they have bazillions of customers, so they don't really care about you, especially if you're from this part of the world and you're little. Um, it's not a slur on them. It's reality. They can't give everyone equal attention. So we need to be the ambitious kit, and we need to basically sort this out ourselves. And I want to show you a few ways that you can watch, monitor, and protect in this kind of defensive way. First things first, no, you won't see this coming if you're not looking. There is not going to be a miraculous moment where you go, the hackers are in, the sirens are going off, we should probably respond. You do not live in some Ghostbusters universe. This does not really happen. In fact, for many organizations, sadly, they are breached, and about 18 months later, they find out, unless somebody paste bin the contents of their database somewhere in that gap. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I like being gainfully employed, and I find having the contents of my database on paste bin detrimental to future employment prospects. So we probably want to get to this before somebody does it for us. The thing we need to know about monitoring our applications is that we need to know what tools to use. Now, have any of you got special security monitoring tools? Bits? OK, good. Because I don't have to unpick things. 
Funny thing is about security monitoring tools, they're not really security monitoring tools, they're just monitoring tools. I'm going to show you actually how to do security monitoring without anything specific and scary and security related. Because if it's close to what you already do now, then you'll do more of it. If I make you have another world of complexity, you're just going to put it on your list of to-do and you're not going to do anything. How many of you are using things like Raygun, uh, Sumo Logic, Rollbar, any of the uh, New Relic? How many of you own six New Relic t-shirts? I'm pretty sure that's all they do at the moment is give out New Relic t-shirts. These tools are perfectly valid. I'm going to show you a couple more on top. So why am I telling you this is valid? Because perception is really dangerous right now. At the moment, there's this kind of prevailing culture that security really has their stuff together. How many of you have a security team? About 50% of you. The rest of you, it's the Wild West, right? We are kind of just making this stuff and trying to get on with it. We think our security team know what we're doing. We think they understand our code and our world. We think they have managed border, border devices and budgets and management support. I'm going to tell you they don't. Most of them are fighting the same battles you are, just from a different angle. And they have to care about a much wider range of things than just your application. So sometimes you have to take the initiative and go there yourself. Security, uh, I'm really sorry, but we kind of seem to think that you lot are cowboys that watched Mr. Robot once and thought that was cool. Um, that you don't care, it's just throw it on the internet. But I know that's not true. I've worked with some really amazing developers in the last 12 months, and I can say categorically you care. But you care about other things too, usability, scaling, performance, that you don't have to get out of bed at 2 a.m., that you, know, you can possibly keep your skills up to date long enough to get a job in the future. There's a lot of things you're caring about. So the reality is the inverse, where security is trying very hard, but there's more of a problem than we know how to fix, and we don't understand your world. Most of us don't even speak developer very well. I, you know, I have to kind of Google the occasional phrase at a .NET conference. I'm like, what? what? I have no idea. Um, I'm a Python girl. That's what we do. But you lot, you already have all of the moving parts needed to do a kick-ass security monitoring system. You just don't know what they are. You have logging tools. You know your application space inside out, back to front, because you wrote it. That's kind of like a, a bit of a, a step ahead from where people like me come in. You have access. You probably shouldn't have access, for the record. How many of you have production access to a system? How many of you shouldn't have production access to that system? Yeah, one or two of you. The rest of you think long and hard, you probably don't need it. There's probably a robot that could do your job better and more secure, and that's OK. I'm not saying make you unemployed, but you know, deployment tools are there for a reason. You have an incentive to care. The DevOps movement, this movement of getting you to own your code from the minute it's conceived to the minute it dies a fiery death on a server, means you're supposed to care about it for its entire life, and that includes the security stuff. And nothing surprises a developer more than me ringing them at 2 AM and saying, SQL injection, how do you feel about that? We don't want that. We want to stay in bed, because that's where the fluffy, warm pillows and things are. So what are we going to do? We're going to log all the things. And I'm going to show you what we mean by that. Now, I'm not going to go into application logging. You've got this covered. Um, if you want to spot SQL injection, don't go looking for a security device, device. Start looking at the slow query logs on your server. If you've not already configured it to log things that take more than two seconds or whatever, A, your performance and scaling is probably broken. And B, you won't spot an attack. But you've got it there already. So let's not worry about that. Let's talk about the other things. Let's talk about the bits of your stack you're probably not paying any attention to. How many of you use any cloud tools in your, your world? I know I heard some people talking about compliance-heavy environments and on-premise earlier. I'm sorry for you. Um, but we've got GitHubs. We've got password managers. Uh, anyone using Team Foundation Server out in the cloud? Yeah? We've got bits and pieces around the place. Some of it is important, some of it is not. We need to actually be logging and monitoring all of it, even though we're developers. And that will feel quite strange to some of you. Because I'm going to tell you as an attacker, I'm not going after. Yeah, that, OK, good. I'm not going after your code base if your code base is super secret squirreled in a basement in a building somewhere. I'm going to go after all of the things around the edges. I'm going to go after your personal accounts, every last one of them. I'm going to go after your laptops. I'm going to go after your mobile devices. And I'm going to go after your cloud tools, especially powerful cloud tools. So the ones I'm going to show you an example of today is a password manager, because I think we have to start thinking about this really carefully. Which tool in your environment could destroy you that you never, ever think about looking after and securing? That's the question for most of the teams I work with. GitHub is a great example. Um, there was a compromise about 18 months ago, two years ago now, 
of an online version control system, file upload system. You know, you could keep version histories and lots of people were using it for their code snippets. They were compromised. They weren't just compromised in the lol I got into your box, you should feel bad. They were compromised in that fun sort of horrible way where the attacker doesn't just go lol you should feel bad, they then delete every backup you've ever created. Which that's not a bad day, that's the end of a business. Now, it doesn't matter if your things are on premise or not, because a lot of us open up to remote working, or we have a VPN endpoint that you can get in via. A lot of these things need to be looked after because they're holding sensitive things that you're not touching day to day and thinking about. So I'm going to show you an example. Um, and then I'm going to show you how, what it means to actually watch those logs. How many of you will admit that you only look at the logs when you're debugging something? Yeah, most people. Because staring at logs is boring. It's walls of text and post requests and that bit of your API that you know shouldn't be triggering just happening again and again because somebody's got a script somewhere and it's really annoying you. So you filter it. You, you, know, you send your reports off to an inbox filter somewhere. You, you have a dashboard for when the auditors come. Um, but the rest of the time you close it down because it's making Chrome eat all of your memory and you've no idea why you would even stare at it anyway. How many of you are Slack or HipChat centric? You've caught chat ops. I'm, I'm fully in, in the chat up space. I was IRC before that. Um, then I realized I hated servers. Um, so now somebody else does that for me. We have a policy, if it doesn't get into Slack, it doesn't exist. But Slack then for us is a super, super powerful gateway to all of our secrets, right? That's scary. How many of you have two-factor on things like your Slacks and your GitHubs? How many of you wish you did or know you should? It's the world. We already know your password habits are bad, and now I know you don't have 2 OFA, stripey t-shirt guy. You're looking really good as a target right now. So, first rule of Fight Club is never build it yourself. And it's not a first rule of Fight Club, but I'm going to say it anyway. So, you already have monitoring and logging tools. If you have a nice solution for this, please use it. If you are already buying a product, go use it for security too. I'm going to show you what happens when you homebrew this and when you throw it together and what you can achieve with basically no money and a bit of enthusiasm and some string. Um, all of the code that I'm going to show you is open source. You can go down and delete, uh, delete, no, um, download this yourself and run it. Um, but hopefully you'll see what I was trying to achieve and what you could do yourself as an example. So I'm going to show you something, LastPass Lambda Logs, which is an open source project. It's just one script. You can download it from us. It's fine. It's terrible Python. Uh, we have one rule when we open source software, and that's if you find a problem with it, I feel good. That's great. Fantastic. If you don't pull request it, I didn't hear it. So fix it. Don't whine. That's my only rule. Um, we're going to use Sumo Logic a little bit, but other logging tools exist. I'm just using it because their free tier is pretty good. Um, also going to talk very briefly about Seam Monster and the Elk Stack, which is Elasticsearch with Kibana. Now, um, like I said, my demo box is the way of the dinosaurs right now. It is dead as a dodo, and the internet is not liking me. Don't try and do Docker pull from this Wi-Fi. Never, ever do that, ever. Um, on the plus side, I now know they filter once you hit a certain cap. So, I've already asked the lovely gentleman at the vendor booth on the other level uh, for Elasticsearch and Kibana to do a demo if you want to go and have a look at that. Here's my caveat to that. Their interface sucks, their filtering language sucks, but it's free. And you can stand it up in a VM really, really easily. So please go uh, use, get their stickers, get their demo. I am in no way affiliated with them, but it is actually pretty usable. So what did I do? Well, I've got a problem, you see. I use, well, I don't use, uh, one of my clients using LastPass. LastPass is a great tool if you don't like user interfaces too much, it's fine. It stores passwords. Nice and straightforward. It had a bad week last week, but I still recommend using it. It's, it and 1Password are very good solutions. The trouble is, it's the crown jewels of an attack surface, right? I know that inside that password manager is not just your passwords, but probably all of the infrastructure you connect to, all of the shares. I know who is trusted from what. I can tell you a lot based on what is in LastPass's databases and data stores, which as an attacker makes it really interesting. And as a defender, it means it's a nightmare because it's given us good things, but at the same time, it's come at high cost. How many of you look at password managers and have that icky feeling of this doesn't feel right, we shouldn't be doing it? You should. This is like ass backwards compared to what we should be doing with security, but trade-offs. So what I wanted to know was, well, can I see if somebody's trying to brute force LastPass accounts? 
because if you've got all of your secrets your infrastructure in there, you're probably going to want to know this. And in fact, you're going to want to know this loud and clear, somewhere very prominent. So there is no nice solution for this. This is not one of these tools where you just plug it into a logging solution and it goes, yay, because LastPass are not good at APIs. Um, they're new at them. And enterprise in security world doesn't always mean what you're used to. It doesn't mean an easy to configure API that plugs into everything. There's often a little bit of fiddling you need to do. So we're going to take from LastPass we're sending it, we're polling it using AWS Lambda with all of the joys and pain that that means. We're sending logs to S3 and to Glacier so that we've got a mutable store of them. And then eventually we're sending them out to Sumo Logic, the same place our application errors are going, so that we can put them into our dashboards and our alerting. Because our Sumo Logic can talk to what? It can talk to PagerDuty, which is super important if you're running your ops through it. It can talk to Ops Genie or the equivalents. It can talk to your Slack channels and your email. So what we're doing is we're taking a tool we want to use but we're concerned about. We're stringing together some very, very cheap or easy components with some terrible Python. And good things hopefully happen at the end. So here's some lessons I learned on the way. I can show you the code. It's very easy. It's less than 20 lines of Python. And even .NET developers can read Python, I've been assured. It's quite easy to master. Um, you can't write Lambda in .NET. You, you, you write it in JavaScript or in Python. So you kind of do have to get used to a scripty kind of language. Things I've learned. Other people's APIs suck. Really, really suck. So if you're going to get into this homebrew security space, please be wary that two things are going to happen and you're not going to realize it. Firstly, they will intermittently change their format between JSON and XML, and it will make you cry. Um, many deep, salty tears. Um, they will not warn you about any of this because they don't know anyone's using it. They're not monitoring these APIs. They are there for integrators and things, but this is like a side project for them. Their main affair is the main product itself. So if you're expecting support or something, please be gentle with them. They really aren't expecting what you're about to do with them. Um, other things to note, they're not used to people using them for actual logging purposes. When I first started using LastPass, their time um, granularity was in 24-hour periods. Now, just a, a survey for the room, how quickly do you want to know you've been compromised on LastPass? <laughs> Is it A, less than, or 24 hours, or B, greater than? Because, yeah, it was a problem. They've, they've changed this now. They have taken a lot of feedback, and we've kind of been emailing them and getting them in a good direction. But remember, people who design APIs, you, as people who design APIs don't always think through the strange use cases who walk in your door and decide they're going to string it together to a logging system. So always ask questions, make friends with their API team. But remember, it's probably two guys who are a bit confused by why you exist. What I'm describing to you is complex and fragmented. We know from software engineering this does not end well. Just because you have seven Lego pieces you can string together and build a cathedral does not mean you should do it. What I'm doing is improvising. What I'm showing you is that security isn't about having a finite, perfect version for now. It's about getting something done and doing something until the industry catches up with us, until something easier is available. But remember, that this, the more you engineer, the more you have to support and the more it's likely to break. So before you go all gung-ho and go, I'm going to do a library for every single cloud tool they have, prioritize. Do one at a time. Make sure they're the ones you really want to focus on. Because these things are like house of cards. One step breaks, and you're in trouble. Now, on that front, any, any Lambda users in? OK, good. Right. Ease yourself gently into this one. Lambda is great. In fact, serverless, I'm, I'm actually generally very excited. As an attacker, it's fantastic. Because normally, I compromise one person. Uh, I'm not really interested in you, nothing personal. Um, I'm trying to get through a network, and I'm doing what's called pivoting, because the treasure is somewhere at the back in the financial system, or it's in a database over there. So I'm compromising hosts one after another and hopping around it like a strange treasure hunt. Now, in serverless, you can't do that, because the server doesn't exist. Um, it services the request, and then it disappears into the ether. So I can't stay on there and go, oh, right, this is interesting. Where do I go next? Because it's not there anymore. So Lambda's very, very cool for that. It does mean, however, I'm going to compromise your AWS account, so you probably want to be careful with that. Uh, you know, we all know where all of our AWS keys are, right? Yeah, totally, absolutely. We've got that sorted. I know where they are. There's a script you can use on GitHub. Um, 
So other things we learned and I'll show you, custom filter languages. So the script is simple. I will show you the script in a second. That's going to get you data. Data on its own does not a dashboard make, nor alerting. In fact, filtering in security tools, in logging and monitoring tools, is the devil's work. I used to hate regex, but now I miss regex. Straight up regex would have made my life simple because it was documented. This is the kind of stuff you have to write when you're writing your security logging, you know, looking for different headers and user agent strings, looking for different patterns in the traffic, and it's gross. How many of you are looking at this going, this looks fun? Every time you see a pipe symbol, it's piping input from one into the output of the next. It's a chained regex almost covered in pseudocode. It's disgusting. Um, this is not happy fun times. Um, so this is one of the costs of doing it. Nobody is going to dress this up for you. You're going to have to figure this out yourself. And there's going to be a lot of trial and error in this. Um, no, you're not on your own, though, because sysadmins have been doing this kind of rubbish for years. And actually, if you sit them down with a piece of cake and some coffee, we'll probably very gladly explain what the jazz is going on here. Most security tools, most monitoring tools are not written by developers. They're written by engineers who were solving a problem they had themselves. And this made sense to them. It doesn't to mere mortals like me. So I'll show you the code. It's super, super tiny. And you'll all be like, oh, wow, that's boring. Um, but that's security. Last. Tumblr. One little file. Oh, really? Yeah, OK. <laughs> oh, life. Life is hard. Yeah. Bye. All right. Let's open it with Atom. Maybe that will play nice, hopefully. Come on. Hey, please. Please, please, please. All right. OK. So this is the raw code from GitHub. So I'll just walk you through it. Uh, note for the record, I'm an ops coder. How many of you are ops coders from a background? Ops coders means that we don't necessarily do engineering as you're used to. We're not very good at comments. We don't do tests. Um, we feel bad about this occasionally. So it's very simple. Let's have a look. So we need some API keys and stuff. We're used to dealing with APIs. It shouldn't be hard. We do some jiggery pokery with some date stamps and some timestamps so that we can make sure we get the right interval. At the moment, this is pulling back in 15 minute in intervals. Because it turns out, if you pull back every minute, while well, you'll have glorious data, you'll drown. Because if this is one of your tools and you have 127, if it's pulling every minute, it A gets expensive and B gets really noisy. So you have to kind of set your tolerance on how much noise you can wade through. And the request is as simple as that, just nice blob of JSON. Easy, easy, easy. That's uploading it to S3. That's nice and easy, right? Anyone looking at that going, I couldn't do it. This, this, is, this is literally examples from AWS web pages kind of level. I know this because I don't do this for a living, and this was an afternoon project. So if I can do it, you lot would probably far exceed what I can do. And that's it. That Lambda handler there is all that Lambda needs. Um, most of that is actually dodgy comments and print statements. I did a try-catch block because I thought you might like care about those kind of things. And I've heard that developers do that. Um, that's it. We make a call to an API with some dates. We get some data back. Job done. You've just taken a tool that previously you had no visibility and no logging on, and you've pulled the logs, and you've put them somewhere safe. You've put them into S3 as hot storage, so you can just pull them very quickly. And then you can auto-generate into Glacier for that, which is their long-term cold storage. Fantastic. There are people in your organization who do not know that you can do this who would have kittens of joy that you can. There are audit people and compliance people who are terrified of these kind of tools because they cannot see them. And we did it in you know, a few lines of really awful Python. So see this as an opportunity, something you can do for your team that will help. Now, you can do this for GitHub. They have really good APIs. It's verbose. If you start wading through the logs and APIs in GitHub land, there are dragons in there. You will lose time. Um, find a friendly GitHub developer. I, I, I highly recommend that. Um, but go and do it. I want you to know for every tool, every hosted service you're using, where you can find that information and how you can pull it together. Because it's better to see the stuff coming than it is to be surprised by it later. Now. That's great. We've talked about Lambda and Sumo, and that's great, fantastic. I will show you dashboards and things afterwards if you like. 
Other ones you want, might want to try. Um, there are two on the list here. Uh, Elk, which is Elasticsearch with Kibana, which is a brutally bad user interface, but very powerful, free. You can, there are Docker images for it. I recommend Elk Docker, which is the one that's on the list. Um, Docker pull, Docker compose up, job done. Um, you can use this to generate lots of alerts, lots of rule sets, really, really nice, and it processes pretty much anything you throw at it with enough regex. Steam Monster is like the next generation that's got Elk underneath the hood. It's free again. There's a virtual machine you can download um, and run it locally that automatically comes with nodes. You can pass uh, syslog and things straight into it and be up and running in just a couple of hours. There's lots of good tutorials. If you're in that kind of enterprise-y space, they do sell product, I'm sure of it. There's probably a business model somewhere. But I've only ever used a free version. I've never needed anything else. So. We've got some locks. Hopefully, we're going to spot some things coming. Fantastic. Even Batman has to watch the skies and do creepy things on mobile devices. But the reality is we've got to learn how to respond, because whether you like it or not, you are not John McClane. You are not going to su superiorly just like barge into an incident, I've got this. It's not going to happen. Instant response is actually heavily into my background. I used to do very hardcore instant response in a basement somewhere. The kind of instant response you can't do for more than four years without really burning out. And this is kind of what it is. You move fire into other piles of fire and hope you survive. Some of you, when faced with a security incident, will think it's the most exciting thing ever. And you people just need to sit down and go and let the grown-ups do their thing. The people of you that will hide in the bathroom because you don't want to deal with it, that's OK, too. I've met you. I've met people like you. I've met grown Marines who do that. There are some of you who will need human touch that, whether you like it or not, will get strokey with arms. And that's nothing to do with gender, absolutely nothing. It's just because under stress, you react that way. Instant response is something you have to practice and you have to drill because you are not going to understand your stress reactions and how you're going to cope with this until it's too late. Now, I mentioned Tavis Ormandy earlier, who's having a bit of a, a, a fun time with uh, password managers this week. But previously, he's had fun times with Symantec products. Now, imagine your organization if your flaws were made public this way. A tweet happens. I found some stuff in Semantic. This is awesome. Because it's never just one tweet with Tavis. It's a tirade. And sometime in the middle of it, he also mentioned there's a critical security flaw in bathroom scales. You know, this is a continuous stream of potential incidents to your organization. How many of you t speak to your social media team and figure out if somebody is doing this for your firm? You really should. Because most of us don't look at this as our source of incidents. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do if you know, somebody posts it on the Twitter or they send you an email? Dear sir, I found a bug in your software and I've got your database. Thought we should talk. A little while ago, that would have been an odd thing, but now it's actually pretty common. I'm going to point you at some things that I think you should really go and look at. So Scott's already mentioned earlier today, Chaos Monkey. Please go look at that. It's fantastic. It's not a security tool particularly, but really, really useful. I'm going to send you to an ISO standard. How many of you are disappointed in me in this moment? It's OK. It's OK to feel like this is wrong. There's a free ISO standard, and it's not long, and you really should read it. Um, it's the Responsible Disclosure or Vulnerability Disclosure ISO standard. It's probably 12 pages max. And it tells you how to cope when somebody sends you a problem and says, I found bugs in your software. Here's how you should deal with it. It's the only ISO standard in security that is free of charge. And it is a glorious template for you having a process for this yourself. So please go read an ISO standard and go copy paste from it. Go find HackerOne and BugCrowd. Go and learn from them as to how the marketplace works and why you're going to find vulnerabilities. And if you're not already signed up to them, consider getting someone to sign up for you. There are free versions of these programs. We use them ourselves. We find good value. We get a lot of crazies, too, but you do get value. And the other thing is, if you don't know right now what you would do if your database was subtly corrupted over 18 months, or you don't have enough logs to figure out what happened two weeks ago, let alone 18 months ago, these are the things to find out in your instant response drilling and your practice. And it can be good fun. Any D&D geeks from like back in the day? Like, just imagine this is like full on role play, roll some dice, have some fun with it. Um, the more you throw yourself into this and the more you're prepared to respond, the better you're going to get at it. So let's just bring it back together for the last five minutes of the most important bit of this talk. I'm only giving five minutes the most important message. The second you get into security and start caring about your stuff, 
in that space, your life is about to get really painful and sad. I don't mean to bring that into your world. It's just the way it is. There is an enthusiasm curve that you go up. I'm going to conquer this, and I'm going to save the day. And then you realize everything really is screwed. Um, and that's not dramatic. It just is. In the same way that your code is going to break in 20 different ways before you get back from the end of this conference, and somebody is going to need you on the end of a VPN connection, it's going to happen. Now. We are unusual in our company and in our approach to this, but we kind of, we know that this sucks. I want you to embrace it and just get on with it. Know that everyone is sucking at this, that it is hard for everyone, and doing it on your own is pointless. You need to talk to other people, talk to other developers about why this sucks and what worked for you and what didn't. Open source your scripts. If you write a strange little parser for a cloud tool to do some security for you, it's probably useful to other people. We are big proponents in our organization of blamelessness, uh, this blameless culture. I publicly, I switched to repo uh, from private to public 18 months ago with an AWS key in. I caused $3,400 damage, $3,400 of damage to my organization by that key being used to then mine Bitcoin. We held a postmortem for that. We discussed it. Did it, I pull the trigger? Did I type the command? Yeah, absolutely. But could it have been anyone else in the organization? Yeah, absolutely. Because we have bad days, because we make bad choices, or we misread something, or we're not concentrating. So all of the good stuff that Etsy and, uh, and all of those folks are putting out about blameless this culture, bring this to your security space. In security, we have a tendency to fire someone and then ask questions later. That's not going to solve it. I really want us to talk more openly about vulnerability because if we're not openly talking about it in a blameless way, we'll actually never get more secure. We'll never share our crazy bits of Python that might solve a job that you have to do. We'll never actually look at our libraries and frameworks and ask questions because we're silently trying to fight fires ourselves. I want you all to accept what you are and what you build and it's glorious, wonderful, broken mess that it all is. Because that's the fun. That's why we do it. We don't do it to be perfect. We do it for the challenge of building things. I want you to protect it. I want to pre protect it from yourself more than anything. Um, I want you to watch, and I want you to come up with crazy monitoring solutions that use what you already have. Because you know that. You know how to use it. You can use it in anger. And it fits with your world already. I want you to learn how to respond and know you're not going to respond well. And that someone somewhere in your organization is going to shout and you're going to need to know how you're going to deal with this so that you don't end up all over Pastebin or Twitter or the newspaper, because we all want to be employed at the end of this. And then I want you to share everything you screw up on the way, publicly and humbly and openly, because it's about the only way we're going to survive this is if we do it together. That is it. I am 37 seconds from time. So if anyone does have a question, you're more than welcome to ask. I have rare New Zealand stickers, if you're sticker connoisseurs. Um, and also, I'll be out in the corridor afterwards. So thank you very much for your time. It was lovely to see you.